So today we're going to be talking about uh, proof of reverse Minkowski theorems, plural. Uh, so I think most of you have seen some of this already. Uh, but I've got two hours, so I'm going to show you more or less full proofs of, uh, of these results. So I hope this will be sort of new for everybody. Uh, so to begin, uh, we'll be talking about lattices. So a lattice is a subset of Rn. I'll always write it as a calligraphic L, or my attempt at a calligraphic L. Um, and it's the set. Uh, of integer linear combinations uh, of some basis vectors. So, which I'll write b1 through bn. So, in other words, uh, our lattice is going to be set z1, b1, up to zn, bn, where all the zi's are in z. Yes, always full dimensional. The bi's are linear, linearly independent, and n is both the rank of the lattice and the dimension. So we'll be dealing with lower dimensional lattices, but we're always in L2, so we'll always just assume that the ambient dimension and the rank of the lattice are the same. Uh, so the quantity that we're most interested in is what I'll write as n sub rl, which is the number of uh, lattice points, so the number of y and l uh, with bounded norm, norm bounded by this radius r. Okay. So let's do an example, make sure we're on the same page and also uh, introduce sort of the main cast of characters in the talk. Uh, so our favorite lattice, or my favorite lattice, is very simple. It's Zn. So it's just the set uh, of all vectors in Rn uh, whose coordinates are integers. Very simple lattice. So in other words, its basis is the standard uh, uh, orthonormal basis of, of uh, Rn. And we can ask what, what Nr of, of Zn looks like, right? So for, um, for large R, uh, I won't define large yet. Uh, Nr of Zn is essentially just the volume of the ball of radius R, which I'll write as B of R. And everything here is Euclidean, of course. Um, and if you've never seen this fact before, it might be a little surprising. But the volume of a ball of radius r uh, is about r over root n to the nth power. Um, so in other words, a ball of volume 1 has a radius r roughly root n. Uh, has everyone seen that before? Like, if you haven't, it's kind of a surprising fact. Uh, like in particular, the volume of a ball of radius 1 goes down uh, after dimension 5, I think it is. Um, uh, which, which I don't know, surprised me when I first learned it. Um, but you can see really quickly that, that this is a terrible estimate for small r. So for small r, say r less than square root n over 100 or so, um, uh, uh, this, this is a horrible estimate. And the way that you can see this is just notice that um, the number of points of radius r, of length r, uh, in Zn is at least uh, I'll use notation a little bit, the number of points um, with coordinates uh, with coordinates minus 1, 0, and 1 uh, of this length. right? And this we can compute exactly. This is uh, actually it's 2 to the r squared. Assuming r is an integer, or r squared is an integer, this is 2 to the r squared times n choose r squared. Let me see why. Right, so I choose r squared uh, non-zero coordinates, and I can, and for each one, I have two choices. I can choose uh, plus one or minus one. 
right? And then we can you know, use uh, whatever rough approximation of Sterling we want uh, and realize that this is about uh, n over r squared to the r squared. Right, so this is much, much larger than, than n over n. In particular, uh, for the r's that we're interested in, uh, this estimate would give 0. And this is some fairly large number. Um, right, so the volume is a terrible estimate for small radii. And sort of what we're going to be interested in is, is looking at, uh, more generally, NRL in this regime of small radii when uh, 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 you can't just use a rough volume estimate. Uh, so, OK, this is a lower bound. What about an upper bound? Um, so for the upper bound, I get to introduce the love of my life, the discrete Gaussian. Um, so for s greater than 0 and x and rn, uh, I'm going to define rho sub s of x uh, to be the Gaussian mass of x with parameter s. Uh, so here, this pi is just because if I don't write it now, I'll, I'll, I'll forget and write it later. Uh, so this is just some normalization constant. Um, but notice that this, you know, this is a Gaussian. So it looks something like this. Considering how much I work with these things, I should probably be able to draw it better. Um, and S here controls the width of the Gaussian. So S is something like that. Uh, so in particular, as S gets larger, this value becomes larger. As X gets larger, this value becomes smaller. Um, yeah, S is the standard deviation up to a constant. Yeah, yeah. Although, I mean, in high dimensions, what you want to define as a standard deviation is a little less clear. It's a standard deviation in one direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we can extend this to a lattice. So if L is a lattice in Rn, uh, uh, then we'll define rho sub S of L, it's a gigantic rho. Rho sub s of l uh, to be the sum over all lattice vectors of of rho. So it's the Gaussian mass of the lattice. In particular, it's, it's shown on my T-shirt, right? So my T-shirt, I have a lattice, uh, and uh, uh, the length of these like bars or whatever is the Gaussian mass of all these points, and so rho is the sum of the length of all these bars. Uh, I made the T-shirt for a slightly different purpose, but it still works pretty well. Um, and so we can ask, uh, what's, what's the mass of our favorite lattice? So uh, the Gaussian is very special. Um, in particular, it's a product measure. Uh, and Zn is a product lattice. So uh, the Gaussian mass of, of Zn is very simple. It's the Gaussian mass of Z to the nth power. Cool. And I mean, this, this is an extremely powerful tool. Uh, 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 you know, I won't say much about this, but I mean, this is the lattice data function. Um, you know, Jacobi uses it to prove his four square theorem, for example. Uh, it's intimately related to modular forms. This is uh, a very well studied object. Jacobi came after Minkowski. Now, when did he prove his uh, four square theorem? Uh, Jacobi. Uh, yeah, but this is a different theorem. <laughs> uh, uh, the four square theorem. OK, so Lagrange proved that every integer is the sum of four squares. So this follows from Minkowski? Uh, yes. But Jacobi showed that the number of uh, ways to write every integer is the sum of four squares. Right? And th this is the coefficients of uh, uh, the lattice theta function in four dimensions, I guess. Yeah, he does this via modular forms. It's an you know, extremely short proof if you, if you know the, uh, a little bit of background on this stuff. Um, and uh, we have a, a trivial upper bound um, on. Uh, and R of L based on the lattice theta function, uh, the Gaussian mass of the lattice, should keep my wording consistent, um, it's the mass contribution of a point of length R, or the inverse of the mass contribution of a point of length R times the mass of the lattice. Uh, so this, I mean, rearrange, notice that um, uh, the mass of the lattice must be at least uh, the contribution, the minimal contribution of a point inside this ball times the number of points inside this ball. So this is uh, I mean Markov's inequality, if you like. This is uh, there's nothing fancy going on here. Um, so we can use this to to see how good. Uh, so we had this lower bound here for the number of points in uh, uh, Zn, and we can use this to test 
uh, to see how good our lower bound is, because now we have a way to get an upper bound. So in particular, uh, for s less than 1, um, we can use a rather crude estimate. Uh, so if we want to compute the estimate, uh, if we want to compute the mass of uh, Zn, we just need to compute the mass of Z. And we can just use a, a sort of trivial estimate. So uh, uh, Zn has 0 in it. Every lattice has 0 in it. So every lattice uh, has a mass at least 1. Uh, and then Zn has two points um, of length uh, 1. So they each contribute uh, e to the minus, do I remember the minus sign? e to the minus pi over s squared. The one dimension, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, this is nothing. Uh, and then it has two points of length 2, of length square 2, rather. Sorry, of length 2. Um, uh, so you get a 4 here. And then you get some terms. And these decay very quickly, right? So you, you get 4, 9, 16. Uh, and again, I took s to be small, so that this decays extremely rapidly. right? So this, for the parameter that I chose, this is trivially, at most, say, 3 times e to the minus pi over s squared. And it turns out that this, this is uh, a far better estimate than we need for what we're going to do. Uh, so let's just take uh, uh, some magic number. Let's take s to be uh, square root pi over uh, log of n over r squared. Yep. Uh, then uh, we see that rho s of zn uh, is at most 1 plus uh, 3. We plug in this to here, and we get um, r squared over n. Cool. Uh, to the nth power. Uh, and you know n is going to infinity, and everything I'm doing n is very very large. So we'll estimate this. Just this is e to the three r cubed, I guess. Sorry, r squared. Check out. Um, so we plug that back into here, and we get that uh, n r of z n uh, is at most uh, e to the three r cubed r squared. I don't know why I keep saying cubed. Uh, times, uh, so plug in the same value of s into this expression, uh, we get uh, n over r squared to the r squared. We can just simplify a little. This is theta of n over r squared to the r squared, which was the uh, same. Yeah. This constant e cubed, uh, uh, this, is, this is the right answer. Uh, in fact, you can do, you can get like, uh, 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 extremely precise estimates. Uh, this is a paper due to Mazo and Adlisco uh, showing this uh, for all radii r. The Gaussian mass tells you the number of points uh, uh, um, in uh, the number of points of a bounded norm in, in the integer lattice, uh, which is you know, a rather useful fact. Um, so that's the end. What about for more general lattices? Has everyone followed so far? Okay. Which one, Nicole? Uh, just this? OK. Um, yes, yeah, so this, is, this is, yeah, maybe that was too fast. But so rho s of l, right? It's a sum over y and l of, of hmm? All right, I'll write it again. I had an n up here, and I had an n in the denominator. And this is like, as n goes to infinity, this is e. And I guess this is always an upper bound, right? It's an increasing. No problem. Um, good. Uh, uh, right, so this is at most, say, uh, some uh, y and l uh, y bounded by r, say, at least. Uh, of e to the minus pi r squared. I should be careful. Uh, e to the minus pi, each of these contributes at least r uh, at least e to the minus pi r squared, right? And then this is this is what I claimed. So this is this is n r of l times e to the pi r minus pi r squared. And then I just bring the e to the minus pi r squared over to the other side. OK? So it's just Markov's inequality. Yeah, this is a good time. If, if you're lost now, then, then we're in trouble. So, um, OK. So now for a more general lattice. Um, 
Uh, I mean, so for ZN, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's morally the same idea, right? Uh, uh, morally, like, yeah, I, like I, I choose a function that decays extremely rapidly that sort of has all its mass on one, on one set of points, and then, and then Markov will be tight. That's kind of the point, yeah. I mean, but the, for example, I mean, this inequality is not tight for all lattices. Uh, like, you know, this recent uh, lattice with exponential kissing number due to Vladut, this, this inequality will be very loose for that, for example. Um, so it's not always tight. Zn is rather special, uh, uh, so to speak. The lattice is uh, uh, nice, kind of integers are not too big, not too small with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you need concentration of, of, of this. Um, uh, sometimes it's concentrated, sometimes it's not. For Zn, it's concentrated. And the reason it's concentrated for Zn is essentially Chernoff bound, right? Um, because it's independent. Yeah, it's because it's independent. Time. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, Yeah, but there's only one product lattice. I mean, uh, <laughs> right? I, okay, you can you can scale things, but uh, this becomes a less interesting lattice, I think. Um, okay. Uh, so for a general lattice, um, so for general uh, L and R n, uh, so we have like a sort of similar phenomenon, uh, in particular for for large R. Again, I won't bother to define R. Just think of R going to infinity if you like. Um, uh, NR of L uh, is well approximated by the volume uh, of the ball of radius R divided by some scaling factor, which I'll just call the determinant of the lattice. So in other words, without telling you what the determinant of the lattice is, I'm just telling you how this scales for now. Uh, uh, and the determinants of the lattice you can define you can define in terms of this in, in, uh, equation if you like, but another way to define it is um, uh, as the determinant of the basis of the lattice, absolute value. Uh, and I'll prove that that this is the right constant. Um, uh, it's more or less a trivial proof. Um, in fact, you can see it really, really quickly. Uh, I want to give you a more difficult proof. Um, a slightly more difficult proof, but a really quick way to see this is just to notice that every lad lattice is a um, uh, 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 linear transformation of Zn, right? Uh, and so this is essentially just the same equation, except I've transformed space by, by the basis. Um, uh, so, but let me give you a slightly different proof because I want, I want to sort of introduce basic packing argument. Yes, the fact that this is independent of the basis. Yeah, uh, I didn't even mention that lattices have many bases. I'd rather you not think about that. But yes, um, uh, this is independent of the basis, which is mildly non-trivial. Um, but so why is this true? Uh, well, geometrically, so we have our basis, b1, b2. And in theory, there are higher dimensions, but I won't draw them. Uh, and the basis defines some parallel epiped. Parallel epiped. Um, right, p. And, and p tiles space. Uh, because it's a parallel epiped. Uh, in particular, each of these corners will be at a lattice point. That's sort of the definition of the lattice. Uh, so if I sort of zoom out on this picture, uh, so I can, I can like build this grid defined by uh, these parallel epipeds. Uh, with one parallel epiped per uh, per lattice point, and I can look at some gigantic ball of radius r, which is you know the ball uh, that we're using here, and I can compute the volume of this ball. Uh, uh, and one way to compute the volume of this ball is to count the number of par parallel epipeds and uh, add up their volumes. Because this is a tiling, there's no overlap uh, uh, by the basic properties of volume. Uh, this should hold, right? And uh, so I get that the volume of the ball of radius r uh, up to you know, some minor issues with, with edges, which I'll just sort of ignore because we're going to the limit. Um, uh, the volume of this ball is going to be the volume of, of p uh, times the number of uh, parallel epipeds, which is an r of l. And the volume of p is sort of the definition of the determinant, or maybe the definition of volume 
is, is this determinant, determinant of the lattice. So I get my equation. OK. So nothing fancy going on. I'm just sort of preparing you for uh, the next proof, which is slightly more difficult. Uh, and the next proof tells us, so this is what happens for r large. For r large, we know what's going on. Uh, uh, we can ask how, how large r needs to be, but we'll see in a second that it really doesn't matter that much. Um, because Minkowski tells us that not only is this true in the limit, it's essentially true uh, uh, even uh, for small r. At least we get a lower bound. So this is uh, Minkowski's famous theorem from 1889. This is sort of the first thing that you learn when someone tells you about lattices. Uh, it says the following. Uh, for any lattice, in n-dimensional space, ooh, uh, uh, the number of, in any r, any radius at all, uh, the number of points in a ball of radius r uh, is at least so uh, you know, if the universe were fair, this would be um, the, just the volume of the ball of radius r divided by the determinant. You know, that would be sort of if we understand things completely. Uh, Minkowski tells us that's basically true. You just take half the ball instead of the full ball. Uh, so it's extremely strong theorem. Uh, uh, it was an extremely easy proof, right? So we know in the limit this is how this behaves. And Minkowski tells us that it's never worse than that up to this annoying factor 2 in the radius, which morally doesn't matter so much. Um, and the proof is basically the same proof. Uh, in particular, I'll take some giant ball of radius big R. Uh, and this ball will have a bunch of lattice points in it. And around each lattice point, I'll draw a smaller ball of radius r over 2, little r over 2. Um, and I'll compute the volume of this ball in two different ways. Right? So the volume of uh, the ball of radius r. Well, first, if I take r to be large enough, I know that this is essentially um, uh, the uh, n big R of L uh, uh, divided by the determinant times the determinant. I could do this. Huh? Big R is just some gigantic. It's going to infinity. Little r over 2 is what I want to prove the theorem for. Big R is going to infinity. Yeah, so like I, I should write limits here, but I'm just sort of ignoring like you know edge cases and pretending that this holds exactly for my big R. Um, uh, so this is you know a proof sketch, but it's more or less correct. Um, uh, but yeah, n sub big R. Yeah, uh, but I also know uh, that the volume of the ball of radius R is at least. Uh, let me write it this way. I'll abuse notation a little bit. The number of little balls uh, times the volume of the little balls except that there's some overlap, right? So I, I did not draw these so that they're not overlapping, right? So divided by sort of the max overlap of the small balls, and the number of little balls, by definition, is again n big R of L. I put one around every. Okay. When you say max overlap, is the maximum number of balls covering a single point? Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to bound this very loosely anyway. Uh, uh, in particular, the the maximum overlap is. Uh, 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 it's at most, uh, well, n uh, little r of l, right? So if I have some point um, uh, that's covered by, by two balls, that means that both of those balls 
uh, uh, must be within distance r of, of some point. Right, so they both have to live inside an R of L. That make sense? I don't know what that means. So the, if, if we both cover a point, mm -hmm. the centers are distance uh, r over 2 from that point. Right? They're, they're distance r over 2 from that point, which means they're both at distance r from the same lattice point. That point is not a lattice point? Uh, no. It typically won't be, right? Um, oh, uh, it's doing volume. Oh, it's it's volume. volume. Oh, it's, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where we lose the factor 2. And the factor 2 is tight, so. Um, OK? So the, so the balls of radius r over 2 are not only on, on lattice points? No, 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 sorry. The balls of radius r over 2 are on lattice points, right? But when I do this volume computation, I'm computing the volume of all of space, right? So I have some over, these balls overlap. Like, I mean, I think this picture is helpful, right? So here's lattice points. This, there's no lattice point here, right? So if I want to compute the volume of this larger set, I can sum up all these balls, but I have to be careful because sometimes they overlap. So I have to divide by how much I've double, how much I've double counted, how much I've overcounted, right? And the overcounting happens, you know, at some uh, uh, strange point in space that's not a lattice point, some arbitrary point in space. Uh, but I'm just saying that if if I overcount. Then, it, so if I have two balls that, that uh, intersect at some point, then that means that I have two lattice points that are within distance r of each other. Not little r, not r over 2, but, but r, right? Um, uh, so in particular, the maximum uh, number of overlapping points, right? So if I have a bunch of lattice points that all overlap, that must be the case that all of those lattice points live in a ball of uh, size r around some central lattice point. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a packing argument. I mean, it's slightly more sophisticated. Usually, when you do a packing argument, though, uh, uh, you'll use disjoint balls. Uh, but same thing. You're not losing anything by picking an arbitrary somehow center. No, I mean, I am. In general, this won't be tight, right? Um, uh, right, so, like, I mean, in particular, like, I'm taking. It's tight for some lattices, yeah. Uh, up to, yeah. I mean, also, there's nothing special about balls here. I could have chosen cubes, and it's tight for cubes in Zn. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, so that's Minkowski's theorem. Minkowski's theorem gives us a lower bound in the number of uh, points uh, uh, according to uh, the determinant. So. One way to phrase Minkowski's theorem that I'm particularly fond of is, is global density implies local density. Right, so the determinant tells me that if I look on some gigantic ball, it tells me the density, or it's the inverse of the density. So if I have a small determinant, I have many points in a gigantic ball. Minkowski's theorem tells me that if I have small determinant, I have many points in some uh, small ball. Uh, so again, it's a very strong theorem. It's sort of the, the foundation of uh, uh, the geometry of numbers, which is the study of lattices, if you're fancy. Um, uh, so we want something that I'll call reverse Minkowski. I didn't give it its name. It should probably be called the converse of Minkowski. Uh, and we want something to the effect of uh, local density implies global density. So maybe uh, just, just to point out that uh, before you move to the reverse, it's, yeah. uh, it's an existential uh, theorem. It uh, tells you that you have some integer points in a, in a ball of some radius, and finding one is uh, Yeah, uh, finding one is a... question of finding one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, I mean, computer scientists are interested in the question of actually finding one, or if finding the exact radius r such that this is true, and things like this. Uh, yeah. Right, for Zn, it's not so hard. 
<laughs> yeah, it comes up. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so we want to we want to prove a converse to this theorem. So something to the effect of local density implies global density. In other words, uh, sort of the contrapositive, which is uh, uh, if your determinant is large, then you don't have many short points. Right, so Minkowski, small determinant, many short points. Reverse Minkowski, large determinant, not many short points. So that's the, the morally what we want to do. Uh, we can try to turn uh, our moral idea into something formal. Yeah, well, OK, what does the ball of radius Zn give, right? Um, of radius 1 around Zn. Uh, so there are uh, all, the unit, uh, all the unit vectors in Zn, right? There are two n of those, and then I guess plus 1 if you want to count 0 as well. Right, so Minkowski uh, gives you some pathetically small number. It'll be like n to the minus n, which is off. Maybe n to the minus n over 2. Um, uh, uh, and the right answer is, is about n. Uh, uh, so Minkowski is off here. And in particular, I think maybe obvious point uh, is that in some sense, zn should be the worst case. So Minkowski is pretty incredibly loose for zn on small radii. Uh, uh, and we'll see in a second. Once we sort of formalize this, uh, uh, this intuition, we'll see, we'll see that Zn is sort of obvious. Zn jumps out at you as the worst case. Um, uh, uh, so we want, we want this sort of theorem. Uh, like large determinant means you can't have many short points. So let's just sort of uh, uh, ask whether exactly that's true. So is it true that for all uh, lattices in Rn with determinant uh, Say at least one, um, uh, the number of lattice points in a ball of radius r is roughly less than the number of lattice points in Zn. Say something like this. So that would be sort of the dream reverse Minkowski theorem. Uh, uh, but it has a really big problem in that it's false. Uh, and it's false because the determinant sort of only cares about the lattice on very, very large scale, sort of by definition. And uh, uh, you can have a lattice that looks like this. right? So extremely, extremely dense in a, some subspace, and then sparse between the subspaces. right? So I can, I can rig this so that maybe this is distance 1 over s, and this is distance s, so that it ha ends up having determinant 1. Uh, so on a global scale, this lattice is determinant 1. But if I take, maybe this is 0, if I take a ball of radius r around 0, I can put as many points as I want inside there by taking s to be as large as I want. Does that make sense? So this, this is very, very false. Um, uh, but this lattice is, is obnoxious, right? It's degenerate uh, in, in, the sense, like, in the sense that uh, uh, it sort of has a preferred direction, has a preferred subspace. So maybe uh, uh, I think you know, we come up with a conjecture. It fails. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I'm not very good at board juggling. I'm not going to pretend to be good at it. Yeah, I think we'll be good. I hope. Um, so here's a better conjecture. I'll call it a reverse Minkowski conjecture. Or maybe, because it won't be formal, sort of reverse Minkowski type conjecture. And it was Daniel Dedouche in 2012 who first thought of this. 
And it's essentially just assume that this is the worst, the only counterexample to our, our false Minkowski. Uh, so it says for any lattice, uh, so before I said the determinant should be at least one. That wasn't enough. But now, say the determinant of L prime is at least one for all sublattices L prime. What do I mean by a sublattice? I mean the intersection of a lattice with a subspace. Right? So here, this lattice is determinant 1, but this sublattice was extremely dense. Uh, so this will see that. So is the intersection with the subspace not necessarily subspace spanned by the subspace? Yeah. I mean, if you take a stupid subspace, you'll just get 0. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is it enough to restrict yourself to subsets of the basis vector? Uh, not basis vectors, but lattice vectors, yes. But not basis vectors. Subspace of the generated by, base, by, uh, by lattice points. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, for example, again, I'll give you some terrible basis. The subspace is spanned by it, you know, will only include very, very long vectors. Uh, so they'll have gigantic determinant. Oh, so, yeah. 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 So in general, I mean, the basis vectors are not very informative at all. Um, uh, yeah. So what we want to say, and for any R, nr of l is at most roughly nr of zn. Right? And what makes this not precise is that I'm not telling you how I mean roughly. Uh, and uh, what we're able to prove, what I mean by roughly varies. So, so it's still the same. So, okay. It's like compass. So at the, the end, is, the, is it true, this condition? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I haven't told you what I mean by roughly, but yes, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, I'll prove it. <laughs> uh, so you don't even have to take my word for it. Um, oh, wow, a lot of time has gone by. Um, right. I had a good eraser. Um, but this is not the form we typically like to uh, uh, we typically like to use for this. We prefer to write the following. So for any, I'll take out the up on his offer. I told you I'm not good at this. Yes. OK. So here's reverse Minkowski as we like to write it, as Daniel Lidgen, uh, uh originally wrote it. So for any L, subset Rn uh, with determinant L prime greater than or equal to 1 for all sublattices L prime. Um, and any S greater than 0. Gaussian mass of L is at most the Gaussian mass of Zn. In fact, Daniel didn't conjecture exactly this. He conjectured it with it approximately. But I'm going to be very bold, and I'll conjecture it exactly. We don't know how to prove quite something this strong. And if this is false, I just don't want Daniel to get blamed. Blame me. But this is the real reverse Minkowski conjecture, right? And so in particular, remember that for Zn, Nr and, and R, so the Gaussian mass actually gives you a witness. So it gives you actually a proof that uh, 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 the number of lattice points is at most uh, the correct answer, right? So it gives you a witness that tells you exactly what the number of lattice points should be. At least it gives you an upper bound. Uh, uh, so what this is saying is stronger than just that the number of lattice points in a ball is at most uh, the number of lattice points 
uh, given by Zn, it's saying that actually the Gaussian mass explains y. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, no, so L prime, it's just all sublattices should have determinant at least one. So that's just. It rules the obvious counterexample. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, really, this should say for all non degenerate lattices. Like, it's, 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 so I have to show you this counterexample so that you see that there's a degenerate case that we don't care about, and then this is. Um, but also, I think this formulation tells you why, why this is the right answer. Right, because Zn has a special relationship with this particular uh, 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 set of inequalities, which is that Zn is is tight, uh, is sort of maximally tight on this set of inequalities. Right, Zn has a ton of determinant one sublattices. Oh. Well, no, I mean it has other oh, sublattices yeah, as well. Yeah, but Zn, it does have it has maximally many determinant one sublattices. So that's not easy to prove. Um, uh, but yeah, so morally, I think this is kind of an obvious theorem. Uh, because again, Zn is tight for this. Uh, uh, Zn is tight for the constraint. It should be tight for the, uh, uh, the statement. Uh, and one thing to check, um, it would be embarrassing if we got this wrong. So claim uh, this is true in a neighborhood of Zn. So what I mean by that is if I, if I perturb Zn slightly, the mass, and I, I mean this constraint, I don't decrease the determinants, then uh, uh, the mass only goes down. This is already stuck in the uh, You want to say that you are locally optimal, that uh, yeah. is locally optimal. So somehow you are looking at the space of all lattices now. And yeah. You are now, when you say neighborhood, you are in the space. Yeah, spoilers. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm slowly introducing what, the concept. What, what, is, what would be the meaning of neighborhood? Well, uh, what do I mean by neighborhood? I mean, uh, take Zn, you know, and map it to, to Zn, well, to i plus epsilon times some matrix times Zn. All right, so like take a tiny linear transformation of Zn. Uh, uh, and I claim when you do this, as long as epsilon is small enough, then uh, uh, the mass can only go down. And, and my proof, I think this is an example where hand waving is actually uh, 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 a good way to prove things. So how can I transform Zn, right? So Zn, you can think of like I have like a lower dimensional sublattice of Zn here, and I have sort of stacked up uh, 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 copies of Zn here, right? And so how can I, uh, what can linear transformations do? They can stretch. Right? So if I stretch, all my points just get longer. The mass goes down. So this won't disprove this statement. Uh, I can squish. If I squish, then the determinant goes down, and I no longer satisfy the uh, uh, requirement. So the only thing that's interesting is if I do sort of this kind of linear transformation. Right? So if I do a determinant one uh, 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 transformation, that's sort of a skew. Um, uh, uh, and so this statement is basically a statement about what the Gaussian mass does on skews. Uh, uh, in particular, you can write uh, the mass of Zn as, say, a sum uh, of rho s of z times rho s of Zn minus 1. All right, I mean, this is a very obnoxious way of saying that product measure in a product lattice. Uh, uh, and what the skew does is it replaces uh, uh, this rho as z mi zn minus 1 by uh, uh, z times some, some other vector t. All right, the arrow, so it's clear that it's a vector, right? So the skew shifts things. And how much it shifts things depends on what layer they're in. Uh, yeah, so now, now I'm summing over L, and L is like close to Zn, and what defines. The summation is over Z, and that's the same Z multiplied by Z. Yes, yeah. Although, honestly, this won't matter very much because uh, uh, all I need here is that this uh, is at most uh, the mass of Zn minus 1. And if you know any Fourier analysis, this is completely trivial. Uh, this is because. 
uh, uh, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian shifted is like adding a phase to the Gaussian. Uh, and phases can only make things go down. Uh, right? So it's like, um, uh, so if you know the Poisson summation formula, this is just adding a bunch of cosines into your, into your sum of a bunch of positive things. So it's summing a bunch of smaller things, and uh, the, sum, the sum gets smaller. If you don't know the Poisson summation formula, this is morally just the fact that uh, the Gaussian likes to be centered, which I think maybe is not very surprising. Uh, I won't bother to prove it, because I'll have to show you the Poisson summation formula. Uh, and if you haven't seen it before, you won't believe me. And if you have seen it before, the rest is trivial. Um, Oh, but this fact is going to come up again. So it's the fact that uh, if I have sort of a, le a lattice and then another copy of the lattice above it, uh, 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 the mass is maximized when the copy above it is each lattice point here is above a lattice point there. Is that, does my hand waving make sense? OK. It does, but when you shift, doesn't the determinant grow? No, no, right? So the, oh, de the determinant, determinant only depends on the orthogonal. Exactly. Yeah, my height doesn't change. Yeah. Does everyone see that the determinant's the same as I? Yeah. I mean, if you like, this is like an upper triangular matrix with all ones along the diagonal. So it's kind of. Um, good. So that's our observation. Uh, uh, and with this, uh, uh, I'm. So maybe this is what I'll keep. Buried away in case we need it. Uh. And I'll now outline our proof idea. So, how are we going to prove this statement up here? Uh, so the high-level proof idea goes as follows. And this is due to, so we stole this proof. It's due to Shapiro and Weiss, Rudy Shapiro and Barack Weiss, uh, published in 2016, although the work was actually done in 2013. Uh, they were studying a different function not rho, and they want to show that it was also maximized by uh, Zn. Uh, they also failed to show it, but um, the proof technique is still useful. Um, so step one is just to define the, the set of lattices that we're interested in. Uh, so I'm going to define uh, stable lattices. It turns out that these are well-studied objects. I did not know that when I started this project. Um, as follows. So I'll write it as S, and it's the set of lattices in Rn that have determinant equal to 1. This is a normalization. And all sublattices have determinant at least 1. That definition makes sense? This is my set of non degenerate lattices. Uh, Great. So a better name would probably be reasonable lattices. In fact, uh, Shapiro and Weiss proved that uh, there's, there's a measure on the space of lattices and that with overwhelming probability, every lattice is stable. So these are, these are real strange outliers, uh, these unstable lattices. Um, and then make a sort of surprising observation, maybe. Uh, the set S is compact. So what does this mean? I mean, so I could worry about, like, there's some topology on the space of lattices, and this is this really beautiful uh, area. Audrey Terras has a book on it. There's a metric. You can do differential calculus, et cetera. Um, but for our purposes, we need extremely weak uh, notions. So from my, from my perspective, what I mean by this is that just every uh, stable lattice has a basis with bounded entries. Yeah, 
So you can imagine we're in like the whole space of matrices, which I view as you know Rn squared. Uh, uh, and I just look at bases of lattices. And I claim that every stable lattice has, has uh, a basis with bounded entries. Um, and I mean, I won't prove this formally, but the way that you can see this, so by Minkowski's theorem, we know that a determinant one lattice has a ton of uh, uh, points inside some reasonably small ball. In fact, uh, strengthening of Minkowski's theorem, we can show that it has a basis inside a reasonably small ball. So it's a ton of not very long vectors, and then it has determinant one. Uh, uh, so that's all you need. Okay. Uh, uh, it just any bound. Yeah, it will depend on n, but 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 the bound doesn't depend on the lattice. So for yeah, it's a compact subset of R n squared. Yeah, I mean I think you can take n squared or n to the one point five maybe or something. Yeah, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes yes, bounded in terms of n. Uh. With the right topology, yes. Um, oh, you mean this sub subset of bases? Uh, so the set of set of lattices is not a set of matrices, um, right? So uh, 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 the question doesn't really make sense. So maybe I shouldn't point that out because I'm trying not to distinguish too much, right? But I I can come up with a giant. Uh, with a giant set, a connected, compact set of matrices that contains a basis for each stable lattice. And that's all I need for this. OK, so I'll like to talk about the set of lattices. You can think about the set of bases. Uh, whenever I do anything topological, you can think of the set of bases. Is that, is that fair? Actually, it's very appealing, this notion, but yes. Yeah, it's. You can, you can just, uh, stick to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this. Yes. Not only is it is it connected, it has bounded measure. It, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting. In fact, the set of all determinant one lattices is bounded measure. So there's a probability distribution on it. It's, it's a really beautiful space. Uh, I'd be happy to talk ad nauseum about it. Um, but I won't right now. Uh, the next fact is. Yeah, exactly. Right. So th this would be false, for example, if I could allow arbitrarily small, right. arbitrarily short vectors in the lattice. Right. Then I'd have you know a sequence of lattices that doesn't converge to anything, doesn't converge to a lattice. Um, right. But the the stability rules that out. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like in two dimensions, there's a really nice representation of this set, and this has the stable lattices are a nice subset. I have too much to say about this. I'm trying not to. Um, uh, uh. Third observation is that the map maps the lattice to its Gaussian mass is continuous. Again, you can ask what topology. If you like, you can view this as a map on uh, matrices. And then I think this fact is trivial. It's a, 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 it's a sum over continuous functions on the matrices, and it uh, uh, converges uniformly. If you like, um, but basically the Gaussian is extremely pretty. Of course, this is continuous. Um, uh, so combine these two facts together, and like remember what you learned in, in high school or middle school or something, uh, preschool. Um, uh, so we have a continuous function compact set. It achieves its maximum, right? So there exists L dagger is in fact a stable lattice itself, uh, such that uh, the mass of L dagger is at least uh, the mass of L for all L in S. Right? So this is this really cute idea uh, that, that Shapiro and Weiss came up with, which is uh, uh, think about the space of all lattices for a second, but only a second. Uh, and then reduce to a single lattice. Uh, uh, so before, like we wanted to think about one lattice. We had this weird condition on its determinants. We didn't know what to do. Uh, so we briefly thought about the space of all lattices that we cared about. And we showed that actually dealing with that whole space allows us to look at just one special lattice. And our goal is going to be use pro properties of this one special lattice to bound its mass. And that'll give us a bound on everybody's mass. 
And I mean, what we really want to do is show that L dagger is isomorphic to Zn. Could be a rotation of it or something. Um, uh, we probably won't be able to do that, or we won't. Um, but uh, a weaker goal is to show that the mass of L dagger is not much larger than the mass of Zn. That'll be enough for us. Make sense? So they all have an example? Or? No, we just don't know how to prove. Yeah. So there may be other. There definitely aren't other examples. <laughs> I just don't know how to prove it. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you'll even, you'll even. So I think just the fact that Zn's tight on all these constraints sort of makes it almost obvious. But also, you'll see from the proof, like, Zn's the right answer, and the proof basically tells you that it just doesn't prove it. Um, So I want to say a couple more things, and then I think uh, it'll be a good time to take a break. Uh, so there's only one thing left to do, right? It's just to show that this L dagger is Zn. Uh, uh, and the way we do that is, to, to, is we break it up into two cases. Um, so case one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, in fact, case one uh, is if L dagger lies on the boundary. Avi's cheating. He's seen this before, but <laughs> okay. But if L dagger lies on the boundary of the set S, so the stable lattices then I reduce to a lower dimensional problem. And I'll show you exactly how to do that, because it's easy. Uh, so I mean, the picture behind here is like, you know, we have some compact set. You know, so it looks like this or something. And we know there's some L dagger in there, and so there are two possibilities for L dagger. It lies in the boundary or it doesn't. And you know, morally, like when we have nice functions, like if this function were uh, convex or something, then we know that L dagger would lie in the boundary. And so morally, this is the case that we think kind of comes up. And in particular, Zn lives very, very on the boundary of this set, right? Zn is tight for all of these constraints. So Zn sort of in a corner of the set of stable lattices. Uh, so sort of morally, what happens is that uh, uh, the mass increases as you get closer and closer to the boundary, and Zn is sort of the most boundary uh, 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 lattice of all or something. Uh, uh, so the way we do that is by the following claim. Uh, uh, if any lattice L, Rn, well, I guess the stable lattice is on the boundary, of s, then uh, I'm going to find for you two lattices, L1 and L2, with the following properties. So uh, the dimension of L1 plus the dimension of L2 uh, is n, so the dimension of uh, the original lattice. And let's say the dimension of L1 is at most n and at least 1. So this is like a non-trivial decomposition. Uh, uh, and we have the inequality. The mass of L is at most the mass of L1 times the mass of L2. So first of all, I claim that this is enough to, to bound the mass of L dagger, right? In, to get the right uh, bound that we want, right? In particular, uh, uh, if if I work via induction, and I've already proven in lower dimensional spaces that uh, uh, stable lattices, oh, that's important. They're stable. Um, uh, uh, that stable lattices in lower dimensions are bounded by z in their, in their respective dimension, then this will have mass at most uh, uh, z 
say k, and this will have mass at most uh, z n minus k. Uh, and this is a product, so the total mass, so the product is at most mass of Zn. Cool? So this, this is enough. OK? Uh, I can now find those for you. So what does it mean to be on the boundary? So L is on the boundary. It means one of the constraints in the definition of stable lattices is tight. In other words, it has a strict sublattice of determinant 1. OK? So there exists. That's going to be our L1. L1, a strict sublattice of L with that L1 equals 1. And formally, I'm going to take L2 to be the projection uh, of L orthogonal to L1. But this is sufficiently too fancy. This is, this is just my hand waving again. right? So uh, uh, L1 is some sublattice of, of L. L is given by uh, uh, a bunch of a union of a bunch of translations of L1. Uh, uh, what L2 is is uh, uh, just the vectors between the hyperplanes in which those translations live. right? Uh, uh, and so by definition, L1 has determinant 1. And by the way the determinant works with projections, L2 has determinant 1. Uh, 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 and by my sort of hand-waving translation thing before, uh, uh, the mass of any sort of lattice that can be broken up into L1 and L2 is maximized if uh, uh, the layers are centered. right? So in other words, if um, uh, this is a copy of L1, and this is a copy of L1, uh, uh, the lattice vectors should be on top of each other. There should always be a lattice vector below each other lattice vector. Is that? I don't like hand wavy proofs, but I also feel like this is much easier than. Uh, it's, the same it's the exact same hand waving. Yes, yes. I assume we're um, No, so the fact that the determinant of L2 is 1, is, this is. Uh, uh, I mean, OK, so pretend. Uh, 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 L1 is n minus 1 dimensional, right? Then this means that L1 has determinant 1, and uh, the determinant of uh, 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 L is this times this distance, right? Yeah, so then L2 would have length 1, which would be a length 1 vector. The higher dimensional analog, which I can't show with my hands or on the board or anything, uh, is the same thing. Um, uh, uh, so what I hopefully have proven with my hands is that the mass uh, of L is at most the mass if I center things. Right? So if I center things, we call that the direct sum of L1 plus L2, uh, uh, which is, and the mass of the direct sum, uh, just like the mass of Zn, is just the product of the two masses. So this is what I was trying to prove. Uh, I suppose I also have to prove that L1 and L2 are stable. The fact that L1 is stable is trivial. All sublattices of L1 or sublattices of L as well, so they better have determinant at least one. In fact, the L2 is, is uh, 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 stable follows from the fact that if I have a sublattice of L2 that has determinant one, then I can lift it. So L2 is some projection of L, then I can lift it into a sublattice of L that has determinant less than one also. Um, so there's nothing fancy going on there. Uh, uh, so if I live on the boundary, I'm done. So the only hard part is uh, case two, which is what if L lives in the interior? Yeah, I believe that it doesn't. No. Yep, exactly. It would follow that it's a product lattice, and there, again, there's only one product lattice, so it, it's the end, so that we'd be done. Um, in fact, the, this inequality here is tight if and only if uh, L is a direct sum. So not only would the global maximizer be the it would be unique up to rotations. Um, so case two is uh, if L dagger 
uh, lies in the interior. And there are sort of two ways we want to handle this case. So 2a, prove that this doesn't happen. Uh, so prove uh, 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 that rho s of l has no local maxima. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you take a lattice and you perturb it in some determinant one way, uh, 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 it should never have larger mass than all of its neighbors. Right? So if I lie in the interior somewhere, then any small perturbation is going to keep me in a set of stable lattices. Uh, uh, so if I'm a global maximum, I better also be a local maximum in the sense that any perturbation should only uh, decrease my mass, or at least not increase it. Uh, uh, and I'd like to argue that that just doesn't happen. Uh, uh, if you've heard me give this talk before, you might have heard me say that I think there are no local maxima. Oded's not so sure. Uh, it turns out Oded was right. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are local maxima. So there somehow magically exist these lattices inside the interior of the set of stable lattices, such that even though they have much lower mass than Zn, any tiny perturbation will decrease the mass. So they have larger mass than all of their neighbors. Uh, so this was the way we were trying to prove this for a very long time. We've now given up. Do you know how they look like? They look, uh... I can give you examples. Uh, they're very symmetric. They sort of have to be. And yeah. I don't have a good understanding for why they're local maxima except for the proof, which isn't that difficult. Um, yeah, they're very, well, we have one example that looks a lot like Zn, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, the other ones actually look a lot like good packings. So in 24 dimensions, uh, there are a bunch of special lattices called the Niemeyer lattices. And basically, uh, one of them is a local minimum, and the others are local maxima. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you have to. Uh, the question is not well defined, right? So a random lattice. You don't need to be stable. Uh, well, no, it will be stable with overwhelming probability. But what do you mean? Do you mean an expectation? Like an expectation, the Hessian will be zero. So it's like not. It's not clear what you mean. Um, yeah, so you have to. Uh, in expectation, right? I, it'll almost never be zero. This is a measure zero set, but in expectation, it will be. So you have to, making the question well defined is difficult there, I think. Um, so we need 2b. And 2b, this is again an idea of Shapiro and Weiss, is just to show if you are local, show that any local maximum. Has bounded mass. Yes. In the interior of mass. I'm in the habit of just calling these local maxima. Um, Maybe a bad habit. Uh, right. So I want to use the fact that any tiny perturbation of you, uh, uh, any tiny perturbation of this lattice uh, uh, decreases the mass, or at least doesn't increase the mass. Um, uh, to show that uh, somehow your mass is bounded. Um, uh, you know, in particular, these local maxima have a lot of properties. Um, so, so one can hope to do this. Uh, uh, and this works, kind of. The reason that it only kind of works, which we'll see at the break, is that First of all, I don't get the theorem I want. I don't end up with Zn. I bound these masses, but I don't bound them by the mass of Zn. I get a weaker bound. And second, I don't know how to go through this argument directly with the Gaussian mass. I'm going to have to switch to another function, uh, which will be part two. Uh, so I think now is a very good time for a break. Maybe questions first, if anyone has. So now we're starting in part two. And 
the idea for part two is we're going to start uh, rather than working with the Gaussian mass, which is my favorite function, but which we don't know enough about, uh, we're going to work with uh, uh, something that other people who are smarter than I am have thought about. So that's kind of the goal. Uh, so give a rough outline of what I'm going to say before I say it. Huh? I don't think Gauss ever thought about the discrete Gaussian. Yeah, but obviously I'm smarter than Gauss. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to associate a convex body uh, VL to every lattice L. And uh, why do we do this? I mean, one answer is because it works, but another answer is because, again, very smart people have thought about convex bodies, fewer people have thought about uh, uh, the discrete Gaussian, or maybe lattices in general. Um, and we're going to find some function. It's in fact going to be quite a natural function, gamma s of v, I'll call it, uh, such that gamma s of vl is roughly the reciprocal of L. I guess ideally I'd take it to be the same thing, but it happens it's going to be the reciprocal. Um, this convex body is not going to be the parallel pipette. No, it's not going to be the parallel pipette. Uh, there's one uh, convex body that comes to uh, Yeah, but the basis isn't even unique. This, this can be a very ugly object. The object we're going to be using is also ugly. I don't know. <laughs> um, so then we're going to use this, this Shapiro-Weiss technique uh, proof technique on gamma on gamma of V of L so in other words we're going to show that uh, 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 we're going to study gamma on a set of stable lattices. Gamma is going to be a continuous function on a set of stable lattices. It's going to have a global maximum. Uh, if it's on the boundary, everything works out uh, in exactly the same way as rho. Uh, uh, and then we're going to look at local maxima. And we're going to try to bound gamma on local maxima. The most difficult part of this entire proof is the fact that gamma is the reciprocal of rho. So I used to be talking about local maxima, now I have to be talking about local minima. It's really difficult. Uh, so my inequalities will be in the wrong direction half the time, or maybe 60% of the time. Um, so that's the high level idea, let's do it. Uh, so the body that we'll be using is known as the Voronoi cell of the lattice. So V of L, it's called the Voronoi cell. And it's the set of all vectors x and rn such that the norm of x is at most the distance between x and y uh, for all y in the lattice. Another way of saying this is that the norm of x is at most the distance between x and the lattice. Another way of saying this is that zero is a closest lattice vector So I'll show you an example uh, Suppose we have some two-dimensional lattice Doesn't show up very well Right, so the Voronoi cell of this thing, up to my ability to draw, uh, looks like this. Right, so it's a set of lattice points that are closer to, to zero than any other lattice point. Sorry, the set of points in space that are closer to zero than any other lattice point. Is there another lattice that is kind of the vertices of that cell, those cells? Is it a lattice factor? 
No, they don't. They, no, no. I yeah, there will be far too many vertices. First of all, uh, so in general, this is a very ugly object. Uh, uh, we we know very little about it. Uh, uh, there are some very strange, interesting theorems about it, but we don't really understand what it looks like. And it tends to have two to the n facets in general. Uh, uh, so it's really quite ugly. Um, but what we need from it is that's a convex body, right? So the fact that it's convex is, I think, immediate from this definition. This is every convex body satisfies such a definition. This is if and only if. Um, it's symmetric as well, yeah. Yes, it's a symmetric convex body. Yeah, when I say convex body, I usually mean symmetric. Yes, it's a symmetric convex body. Uh, uh, it also tiles space, right? So just like um, uh, the parallel piped, the fundamental parallel piped tiled space, uh, uh, VL tile space as well. So what I mean by that is up to you know annoying stuff about the boundary. Um, uh, if I look at all the translates of VL by lattice vectors, I cover space uh, uh, perfectly. Every, every point is covered exactly once, right? And you can kind of see this from the picture. I hope, up to my ability to draw, right? So you get a perfect tiling of space. And, you don't, and this is sort of immediate from the definition uh, because uh, uh, the Voronoi cell around each point is simply the set of points that are closer to that than any other point module of the boundary where there's a collision and we don't care, it's measure zero set. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I want the fact that it tiles space with respect to the lattice, not just... Yes, yeah. Although Voronoi did in fact study them in uh, uh, in the case of lattices. Uh, right, so what do I want to say next? I just don't want to leave anything out. Oh, so a corollary of the fact that they tile space is that the volume of the Voronoi cell it better be the determinant of the lattice. Right, so any two bodies that tile space with respect to the lattice better have the same volume. Uh, we know it's a parallel pipette tiles space. It has volume determinant, so this better have volume determinant. Um, uh, uh, and we have our easy example, uh, the Voronoi cell of Zn is the cube. So it's minus one half to one half to the n. Great. Um, and uh, I'll claim without proof that we have the sort of the same inequality that I showed you before, right? So if we decompose some lattice L, uh, into two sublattices in the same way that I did before. Uh, oops. Uh, oh, I haven't shown you this yet. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Excuse me. Ignore that. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about Voronoi cells. Yeah. Right. So now I'm going to define my function gamma of s. Sorry. Uh, my function gamma of s is the Gaussian mass of the Voronoi cell. Uh, so I don't need to define it in terms of the Voronoi cell. It can just be any convex body v. And it's the integral over the body of the Gaussian mass and there's a normalization factor, s to the minus n. So taking the mass of the point, you take the mass of the closest point. Yeah, so another definition of this, it's the probability. So if x is Gaussian uh, with parameter s, so like, like Avi said, essentially with uh, standard deviation s, and this is the probability that x lands in, in v. So some things to note about this. Uh, 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 so from the second definition, it should be clear that um, uh, as s increases, this value decreases, right? So if the Gaussian tends to be wider, 
it's going to tend to land outside of the, the Voronoi cell, the convex body, more often. Uh, and of course, as V gets larger, uh, 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 the mass gets larger. Um, uh, and morally, what this is sort of measuring, if we fix the volume V, this is sort of a measure of how spherical the body is, right? So for volume one, I mean, this is the Gaussian isoparametric inequality. In theory, it's deep, but it's kind of obvious. If you have volume one, the, the highest Gaussian mass you can possibly have is to be, be a sphere, a uh, ball. Uh, so this is sort of a measure of how spherical you are. Um, in particular, like the worst case should be, should be the cube. Uh, 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 and we have uh, uh, our nice fact so the Gaussian mass of the cube is in fact just the Gaussian mass of the interval to the nth power. So this is the analog of the fact that uh, uh, the Gaussian mass of Zn was uh, the mass of z to the nth power. Um, and this is slightly more general if I have the Gaussian mass of uh, the Voronoi cell of, say, L1, direct summed with L2. Uh, so some product lattice, this is just the Gaussian mass of L1, Voronoi cell of L1 times the Gaussian mass of the Voronoi cell of L2. So it plays nicely. And what I was starting to say earlier, prematurely, um, uh, I'll claim without proof that if I have uh, some lattice L, like I had uh, uh, before, so a lattice say that's on the boundary of the set of stable lattices, then I can again do this decomposition. Uh, just like with uh, uh, just like with, with uh, the Gaussian mass. So in particular, if I'm on the boundary, so this sort of set of, of, of uh, facts tells us that if we're on the boundary, we're essentially done. Right? So if we find some uh, 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 lattice on the boundary, that's our global maximizer, uh, then by induction we can bound its mass by, by Zn, or by lower dimensional sublattices at least. Um, good. What I haven't shown you yet is whether this has any relationship whatsoever to the Gaussian mass of the lattice itself, or to lattice point counting, or anything. I haven't told you why we care about this object at all, and, and uh, uh, there's actually a very simple claim. Uh, Dudu, let's see, Chung, uh, Daniel Dudouche, Lu, and Piker, 2013, uh, which is How? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, just ask me. I think the answer is. I mean. Because, because that's what, the, of course, related to the Gaussian mass, but I'm just. It's just some. some sort of looks dual. Or, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it has some kind of duality properties. I, I mean, it's strange. Like, the proofs of these facts are different than the proofs of the. Like, uh, no, but yeah, I understand. But just relating it to the. You know, because you pack, you, you don't look at both, but you look at another one. Is there another, maybe Minkowski theorem, forget the reverse, in which this is used other than both the Bono cells? No. No. I mean, the only way I know how to use this, 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 proper, this thing is the order I'm about to show you, uh, which is uh, for any lattice, and any S, uh, The product of these two things is the most one. In other words, uh, if I want to bound the Gaussian mass, it suffices to, if I want an upper bound on the Gaussian mass, it suffices to get a lower bound on. Uh, only yeah. The other direction is true when the mass is small. It's up to some factor. But in general, it's, it's very, very false, the other direction. Um, 
So uh, the proof is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, that's why I call it a claim. Uh, so the first observation is that the Gaussian mass of all of space is one. So I chose my normalization factor the way I did, right? So again, we can view this Gaussian mass as the probability that we land inside the body. Um, uh, so I can say that one is the sum uh, over all lattice points of the probability uh, uh, that some Gaussian lands in uh, uh, the Voronoi cell translated by the lattice. Right, so in other words, I have my tiling, and I'm just breaking up uh, my integral over all space into a sum over each tile. Actually, let me stay here for a second. Uh, uh, so say this is zero, and then basically completing the proof, you just sort of think of uh, the moral thing that's going on is just that um, uh, the mass of each tile is going to be the mass of the point inside of it times the mass of the central tile. Uh, uh, that's sort of the moral fact. Uh, uh, so in particular, this probability, uh, there's this factor of s to the minus n, um, is going to be the integral over the Voronoi cell of e to the minus pi length of x minus, I guess I'll write it as plus y squared dx. And, yes, thank you. And then this, we break up uh, into e to the minus pi length of x squared, uh, which is what we want to integrate to get the mass of the Voronoi cell. Uh, times e to the minus pi length y squared, which is what we want to sum to get the mass of the Gaussian mass, times this other term, e to the minus 2 pi uh, xy. And all of these, as Avi pointed out, have an over s squared, which I don't really care about. Um, right, and so I just need to show that when I integrate this term, it ends up being larger than 1. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is by the symmetry of the Voronoi cell. So you can actually kind of see that in the picture, I think. Uh, so like, let's say we look at this Voronoi cell here. I can sort of divide it into uh, terms that are closer to zero and terms that are farther away from zero. And of course, the contribution from these guys is going to be much, much larger than the contribution from these guys because the Gaussian decays rather rapidly. Uh, so that's the basic fact. To see this algebraically, you realize um, that because the Voronoi cell is symmetric by e to the minus 2 pi xy uh, plus e to the minus 2 pi minus xy, which is just e to the 2 pi xy, both over s squared, because both of these terms show up in the, in the integral, right? So I can just lump them together, and this is hyperbolic cosine, which is greater than one. Uh, so that's the whole proof. Again, there's sort of a moral reason it's true and the algebraic way to complete the proof. Um, so our function has the properties that we wanted. We're left with the hard part, which is to actually prove something about it, prove a lower bound on the set of stable lattices. It's all we have left. Um, and in order to do that, we want to study uh, the local behavior of the function, right? So we want to say something about the local now minima of, of this function. Uh, uh, so let's look at its local behavior. What do I mean by its local behavior? It's kind of uh, what we were talking about before around Zn. So I'm going to define L prime uh, to be a tiny linear transformation of some lattice L. So here, I is the identity matrix, epsilon is tiny, and A is some arbitrary matrix. I'm going to define V prime to be a tiny linear transformation of the Voronoi cell of L. Okay? 
Now, an important thing to note is that V prime, no, <laughs> very much not so. I, maybe it's true in some degenerate case, I guess it is, but in general, typically, that's important. And let's just see that. Uh, so the Voronoi cell of Zn is the cube, like we said. Right, so it looks like that. Now if I say apply some kind of skew transformation like this, what happens to Zn? Well, this point sort of comes in, and then gets sort of a corner here. This sort of gets slanted a little bit. It's symmetric, so I get a corner there, and this gets slanted a little bit, right? And this is not the same as if I just took this uh, uh, and applied that same transformation, then I would have got something, I guess, like this, right? But isn't a different A that would make it equal? No, this, this is not a linear transformation of that. It doesn't even have the same oh, topology. The number, of, uh, the number of faces changes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're not linear, linearly related. But the point is, people have studied convex bodies under linear transformations for a long time. There's a lot of theorems about this. Nobody studied the change of the Voronoi cell. Well, okay. Very few people have studied the change of the Voronoi cell under linear transformations of the lattice. So we'd like to move from, from the Voronoi cell of this object to this object. They're not equal, but maybe we can relate them. Uh, uh, and this is, here, this is a good opportunity to credit Oded because this was Oded's big idea. I'll call it a theorem. Technically, I'm part of it too, but it's really Oded. Uh, uh, and it's the following fact. The mass of V prime, it's not quite equal to the mass of VL prime, not the same body, but it's true up to second order approximation. This is kind of surprising, I think. To a dead, it's not. <laughs> um, but so basically, what, what this is saying, uh, uh, to jump ahead a little bit, is that uh, the first order behavior, so the derivatives, in some space, maybe the space of matrices or whatever, of, uh, of gamma of V of L are the same as just the derivatives of gamma of V. So applying a linear transformation to the lattice is just like applying a linear transformation uh, to the Voronoi cell up to the first order. Uh, and that's going to allow us, if we want to talk about local, local minima, uh, that's going to allow us to talk about at least derivative zero points um, um, in the space of linear transformations of V, which is much, much easier for us. The proof, so the proof in the paper is, I think, eight pages long. Uh, so normally I wouldn't show this to you, but Ronan Aldan pointed out that it's like a three-line proof. Uh, we knew that it was a three-line proof, but we didn't know the three lines. Um, we, we, even, we, we asked on math overflow, we like begged, uh, we couldn't find this proof, uh, but it turns out that, that it is in fact a three-line proof. Um, uh, uh, so what I'm studying here, uh, so I want to look at the mass of so the integral VL prime, uh, uh, of, let me write it out. DS, DX, right? And now I'm just going to write this in a stupid way. Instead of the length of x, I'm going to write the distance between x and the lattice. OK? Because I'm in the Voronoi cell, that's the same thing. And now I'm going to use the fact that this is periodic over the lattice. So in particular, I can replace VL prime by any fundamental body, any body that's tile space with respect to the lattice L prime. Does that check out? One example of a body that tile space is V prime. Why does V prime tile space with respect to the lattice? That's totally trivial, right? So I know VL tile space with respect to L 
if I just apply a linear transformation to that tiling, I get a new tiling of space, and it's uh, v prime with respect to l prime. Does that all make sense? So this is the same as if I integrate over v prime of the same function. And now, on the intersection between v prime and vl prime, which again is most of it because this is a small linear transformation. I've done very little to get this change, right? Uh, this is just rho s of x, right? Because on the intersection, uh, uh, this equality still holds. Let me write actually the answer that I want. And then just notice that uh, uh, what I want is what I got. Sorry, what I want is, uh, uh, sorry, what I get is what I want minus the difference. Uh, and the difference, as I just said, only occurs in the intersection. And. It's not a symmetric difference. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, not the symmetric difference, just the difference. Yeah, sorry. Yes, um, uh, uh, and it's of course rho of s of x minus x uh, minus pi distance x l prime squared over s squared dx. And now I'm done because the volume of this is order epsilon. We're here in my big O hiding things that depends on the body, hiding things that depends on the dimension, just all I care about is the dependence on epsilon. Um, and this difference is also order epsilon. Right, I only moved the lattice a little bit, I only moved uh, the Voronoi cell a little bit, so things can only, everything only moved by a factor of epsilon. I guess I have to note here that the Voronoi cell is contained in some finite uh, ball or something like this, but morally this is all that's going on. So. I in integrate order epsilon or volume order epsilon, the whole integral is order epsilon squared. Check out. Yeah, so there's the three, yeah, three line proof of uh, the thing that Odette and I proved in eight pages. Um, So corollary of this is that a local minimum of uh, gamma s vl uh, over stable lattices or over determinate one lattices, whatever you like, um, must be a critical point. of the map that maps linear transformations uh, to the mass of the linear transformation of the Voronoi cell. I think I'm right there. Uh, uh, where t here is a position, by which I mean uh, uh, a determinant one matrix. So I guess I can write that as SLRN. And by critical point, I mean that there's no first order derivative. The first order derivative is zero. You can ask what it means to take a derivative over such a space. One can. Not so hard. Uh, if you like, this means that uh, there's no direction I can move in this space such that when I move to the right, uh, it goes up. And when I move to the left, it goes down. It has to be a second order effect. Uh, so now, if I want to lower bound these minima, I just have to study critical points of, of this function. Uh, and it turns out this is pretty well studied. Uh, in particular, now we're going to use 
a heavy hammer from convex geometry, which is the whole point of all this, is to get us to a place where we can use a heavy hammer. Um, and the heavy hammer is, I am in fact almost done, incidentally. <laughs> uh, uh, so the heavy hammer is, it's a theorem which before it was a theorem was known as uh, the B conjecture. It was conjectured by Banachik. Uh, due to, let me get the spelling right. Cordero, Aris, Araskin, Fred Elisi, and Mori in 2004, which is that uh, the function for any convex body, symmetric convex body, this function that we're interested in is log concave. Provide that T is a diagonal matrix. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, because, right. So, yes. So there's a corollary due to Bobkov, which I won't bother to write, which is that uh, this means that any critical point must be a global maximum. Uh, and the reason uh, that diag uh, uh, diagonal matrices are enough, Bob covered a whole paper about this, but I really don't think it's necessary, um, is that uh, we don't care about rotations, right? The Gaussian mass doesn't care about rotations. Therefore, we can always uh, rotate the body and rotate uh, T times the body such that... Uh, because, uh, yeah, gamma is already... Yeah, gamma is rotation invariant. Yeah. Yeah, so log concavity of rotations, I'm not even sure what it would mean. It would be some funny property. Um, uh, what we really care about is only diagonal matrices. Um, and this tells us this really funny fact, which is if gamma V of L is a local minimum that V of L is a global maximum of gamma of V of L over positions of V of L. So what's going on here is we have sort of the following picture. We have this function, gamma s of v of t of l, where t is some determinant one linear transformation. And we happen to be at a minimum. So in other words, t equals identity is the minimum. And we have this other function that has the same first derivative and the first same, uh, uh, and the same value that's concave. This is gamma s of t of V of L. That makes sense? So, minimum here, global maximum there, yeah? But it's uh, gamma S of? T of V of L. No, 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 above it. V of T of L. Yeah. Right, so I can transform the lattice, maybe it goes up, I transform uh, uh, the, the Voronoi cell, it must go down. Uh, and then to complete the proof, uh, all we have to do is plug in our favorite heavy hammer from uh, uh, convex geometry, right? So now we know that we have a global maximum of uh, gamma SVL, and we just want to uh, say that global maxima have decent mass. 
So all you need to do is say that uh, a convex body has large Gaussian mass. Uh, 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 and we have different theorems for different parameters s. Um, so in particular, so deduce observe that we can use what's called the m-position, theorem due to Millman uh, in 88, I think, um, which is that uh, any volume 1 symmetric convex body has a position greater than 2 to the minus cm for some constant t. So in other words, gamma of 1 is uh, of t of, did I call it something? k is at least 2 to the minus cm, which is essentially gamma of 1 of the cube, which is what we want. So that's option 1. You can plug this in. And this is really nice because it behaves really nicely when we hit the boundary. Right? When we hit the boundary, we're gonna uh, uh, we're gonna get some product of two things: one in dimension k, one in dimension n minus k. And this behaves really nicely. It doesn't matter what the constant is. It would work for any constant, or it's important. No, there there exists a constant. Yeah, I know, but it matters to what it is. It could have been that it wouldn't work at the boundary. That it would no, no, no. Any constant will work. I mean, the result's weaker if the constant's larger, right? So at the end of the day, I'm going to get some bound on the Gaussian mass of any stable lattice, right? And that bound will depend on this constant. But the induction will go, th whatever the constant is, the induction won't mess with it. Ah, oh, but then you may be farther away from the integer lattice. Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. I meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't even know what the best constant is here. Is, uh, you, the, the constant norm gives you a result. I don't know what you mean by sufficiently. <laughs> For me, any constants. No, no, no. So in, in the final result, when you say you get something that's close to the integral lattice, you have this inequality. Yeah, my definition of close. This <laughs> exponential. Yeah. For this, for this result, right? So this is gamma one. Uh, there's another option, which is a theorem known as the L position, which is even deeper than this. Due to sequence of works, Figiel uh, and Tomchuk Jaegerman. I don't know how to spell it, but let's check. I feel like there's like a decent number of people with hyphenated last names in this field, which makes me happy. Um, and Lewis, for whom the L position is named, also in 79, and PZA. This was this long sequence of works that proved the celebrate result in uh, uh, convex geometry, which is known as the L position. Uh, uh, and for our purposes, what it means is that with the same uh, uh, properties as before, we get gamma 1 over 100 log n, and we're at gamma of s uh, of, of tk is at least, say, 2 thirds. It's larger than some large constant for s equals 1 over some large constant log n. This was the original heavy hammer that we used. This is kind of what gives us what we really want. The reason being that we really like constants here, in particular constants larger than a half. Um, uh, for these, these are symmetrization results in some sense, right? Because you can take any... you prove this via symmetrization? That you do, yeah. This... So, uh, yeah, so because that's uh, somehow the spirit, right? I mean, yeah, measures. yeah, this, this, the proof of this, so this is how I say it, like this is really a k-convexity and the proof of k-convexity, not really symmetrization, or at least I don't think of it as a symmetrization proof. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
uh, and this also this form of this theorem is not tight. The right answer here, s should be 1 over root log n, which is what's tight for the cube, not 1 over log n. Uh, we inherit this looseness. Uh, uh, so this isn't exactly the right heavy hammer that we want, but unfortunately this is what PZA gave us, so we're happy with it. Um, and then we plug in these results to our previous machinery, and we end uh, by proving this, which is what we wanted, with a little approx sign there. And I suppose that's all I want to say. <laughs>